All right, folks. So uh, we're going to jump right in. And I'm going to attempt to get through our content in about 45 minutes or so. So we've got plenty of time for questions. What's been happening is I've been trying to jam too much stuff in the webinars and I only get to answer a couple questions at the very end. So we'll see what we can do because we do have a lot to talk about. And I'm, I go off on tangents going into detail about stuff sometimes. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just close this. This is the sort of itinerary for the day. Um, we're going to go through this, the... Um, those basic points. Um, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the Nix Selective tool really quickly. Uh, this is, of course, one of the ways of accessing the software. And um, one of the beauties of the Nix Selective tool is that you can access individual favorited filters and recipes. We're gonna talk a lot about recipes today, how you can make some, um, how you can export them, and so on and so forth. Uh, for right now, I'm gonna go ahead and just click right on ColorFX Pro 4. And uh, we're gonna start with sort of some housekeeping in interface maneuvering and understanding where some of the things are. That's a little bit deeper dive than um, you know the basics of getting used to where the buttons are and what these buttons do. Um, one of the, the main tools that, that I find very helpful with the filter library on the left side here is being able to customize uh, which kinds of photography or what kinds of filters you want to show up uh, here. Right now, and I primarily use the all and then my favorites, which are, um, th those are gonna be sticky for the most part, if I remember correctly. Maybe we can change favorites, I can't recall. We'll look at that. Um, but the all filter list is literally all the filters. Whereas if we click on film or wedding or architecture, these are groupings of filters that are suggested use for these different kinds of photography. Not everybody thinks in this way, like a lot of folks will shoot portraits, but they're less concerned with filters that are uh, suggested by Nick software for portraiture. And maybe they're more uh, interested in looking at the filters that adjust contrast or adjust color specifically. And you can actually change these so that you can get it, uh, create a custom uh, filter library. Okay, so to do that, or somewhat custom, I'll call it somewhat custom, to do that, to change these different sort of library um, facets, you move down into the lower left corner into your settings button. And when you click settings here in Color Effects Pro, uh, you have some interface settings. You can turn your GPU system on and off, your graphics processor. So if you've got a computer that utilizes that, it can be advantageous to have that on. Sometimes it's actually not, but um, that's your GPU setting. Uh, you can tell the software what to do after clicking OK. You can um, give feedback, basically, or, or information as to using the software. So if it crashes or something like that, DxO can kind of get a better understanding of how um, that's working. So that's nice to have on because it helps the, the company actually improve the software. Um, and then the filter list settings. So down at the very bottom in the filter list settings, that's where we're headed. And in here, you can choose your different categories. And just to uh, verify, because I mentioned this, but I wasn't entirely sure, the all and the favorites, those are sticky. Those two are gonna stay there in the filter library. The other six categories, you're able to change um, which categories you want, depending upon um, you know what kind of photography you do or the way that you approach using Color Effects Pro. It is a collection of 55 individual filters. Everybody's gonna approach it a different way. So um, the, the top section here of categories are kind of the different types of photography categories and um, filters that are suggested by Nick Software for those particular categories. And it's really nice to be able to use that because you've got things like portrait and nature and macro photography and landscape and so on. And I'm gonna go ahead and actually just click on landscape we're gonna change all six in this case, because when we end up clicking the OK button, you're gonna see all six of these categories change in the upper left corner. So I'm gonna go with nature, I'm gonna set this one to travel, um, and let's say portrait, I'm gonna switch over to color. Architecture, I'm gonna to change to contrast, and then um, my last category, I'm going to set, how about to uh, glass? These are the filters that emulate uh, glass filters that you might use, both contemporary uh, digital filters that you might use as well as 
um, maybe different kinds of filters that you would use uh, in, when shooting film for film processing. Okay, so glass. As I adjust those categories, nothing happens to the filter library. I think until I click the OK button, and actually I might even need to, because I haven't changed this in a while, I might even need to change or, or um, leave color effects and then come back in. So let's look and see what happens. I'm gonna click the OK button. Nothing happens, right? So right now we've got all favorites, film, nature, wedding, portrait, architecture, travel. I'm gonna go ahead and just click the cancel button here in color effects, and that's gonna, uh, hopefully, we're gonna leave color effects pro. And now when we go back into color effects pro, those categories uh, will have changed. So now I've got landscape, nature, travel, color. And so now, and, and kind of the way that I think about utilizing the software um, is primarily between contrast, tonal adjustments, and color. So uh, if I click on contrast, the contrast category, now we are within the filters that are um, primarily contrast adjustment filters. Some of them do some other things as well, like midnight and Monday morning are, are highly stylistic, but they also give you a lot of control over the, the tonal range, the contrast and contrast range of the image. Um, if we click on color, here are all of the filters that are designed around manipulating color, right? And so again, you've got things like film effects, faded, nostalgic, that does different things, but the primary driver of that filter is, is a color manipulation. And so that falls within that category. Uh, and I'll just click on glass. These are some different filters that you might shoot with. You know, again, primarily, like a lot of these filters, you'd use um, glass, skylight filters over your lens when shooting film. You probably don't do that that often anymore or for any, maybe there's a specific reason, but usually you could just manipulate your white balance in your digital image um, and then use your skylight filter here in post-processing to selectively warm up a skin tone or something like that, or whatever you, you want the skylight filter to be applying. So, that's how you manipulate your filter categories, and it's just a nice added bonus that's slightly more advanced or a little bit more in-depth than sort of the standard usage of color effects. One of the things I love about this software is that you can, in the first day of using this software, it's just it just works. It's up and running. There is some, you know, a little bit of a learning curve because you got to get used to how the filters work and how to add filters, but you can spend days and hours and years, right, playing around with the software, creating your own pipeline, your own workflow, and, and figuring out all of the different nuances within color effects. And I'm, I'm still learning new combinations of things, and I've been using the software since 2009. So um, that's the filter categories. What else I wanted? Oh, I want to show you um, favoriting and then filter presets that are built into the software. So, are built into each individual filter rather. So, uh, with favoriting a filter, right? Note, we have all of the filters here within the glass section. We have this little star and the star is gray on all of these. Uh, if I click on that little star, let's say to the left of polarization, it's now gold. And that's also gonna just show up within my favorites list. And that's, a lot of folks probably are already aware of that, but um, I figured I'd show it because we're here. Uh, another really nice feature that sort of a, a goes into the deeper dive, and I think I actually covered this in the um, initial uh, webinar about sort of the, the basics or the like getting started. But every individual filter has its own kind of set of presets within the filter. So if I click on polarization, I'm actually gonna click on the filter to start with. And then if I click on the little stack of images here towards the right, this is gonna bring me into um, three presets with the polarization filter. You've got subtle, medium, and strong, right? If I go back and we go into, um, let's say classical soft focus, so I'm actually gonna replace the polarization filter with classical soft focus. So I'll just click on the classical soft focus. Polarization is gonna go away. Um, I'm gonna click on our uh, little stack of prints. And here we have four different presets for this particular filter for the classical soft focus kind of effect. Anyways, it's a really nice feature to know is there. I, I think I did cover that in the previous webinar, but it only takes me a few seconds. So I figured I'd, I figured I'd walk you through it. All right, so from here, uh, I want to talk to you about recipes. 
because there are many, many, many things that you can do with recipes. You can create your own recipe, you can export your own recipes and then load them onto your own or other computers, send them to your friends, hypothetically sell them if you wanted to, um, you know, because you're able to create these combination of filters and then um, export them, right? So to start with, I've clicked on the recipes section. Let me move back here because I did that without mentioning what I was doing. I'm going to move into the lower left corner here. I'm going to click on the word recipes and the En Vogue recipes have opened up kind of by default. If I click the back button, it's going to bring us back into the all section so we can um, we can see what's going on uh, with all of the recipes. We also gain access to the import button. So let's say you've saved and exported some recipes and you've, you've transmitted them from one computer to another computer and you wanna get those recipes that you've created into your ColorFX Pro 4 in the new computer. What you would do is go into this recipe section click the import button, and then on your computer, simply navigate to uh, whatever, uh, wherever the folder is that you want to import, right? And so that's how you get them into the software. I actually don't have an example of that here. I just thought about it. I probably should have created one, but that's okay. It's, it's relatively straightforward as long as you know where the button is. All right, so I'm going to move into my custom filter or custom recipes. I've got a bunch because I create them for numerous reasons. Um, some of them are actually film emulations. Uh, some of them are groupings of filters like inverted glow. And watch what happens. So anyone who's not familiar with recipes, note this. We have a single filter open over here, the classical soft focus filter. If I click on inverted glow, um, first of all, my software is going to warn us. It's going to let us know that uh, we're going to replace the filter stack. In this case, it's just classical soft focus um, with whatever the recipes filter stack is. I leave this on so that when you come visit me at a, as a, at a webinar, you see these warnings. Once you know what these different tools are going to do, you can just check that little checkbox off and then it's not going to come up again. I have to leave it on, but um, you can turn it off so that doesn't come up every time. I'm going to click the yes button. As I click the yes button, a couple things have happened. First of all, my levels and curves, glamour glow and infrared film have been applied to create this inverted glow. Another thing that's happened, and I didn't even mean for this to happen, but this recipe has control points actually saved into it, which is a really funky thing to do, um, and oftentimes isn't that helpful, but it can be. So I wanna show you, after we save a regular recipe, I wanna show you how to save a recipe that also contains control points, because it is kind of a little bit more in depth. For now, I'm gonna go ahead and just delete those control points. They're not doing anything. They're actually minus control points or zero opacity control points. So I'll get rid of them. Um, oh, and that's what they're doing. I, I fibbed. So they actually were doing something. They are removing the infrared film filter from those areas. Good to know. So um, long story short, a recipe is a collection of uh, filters that you've created yourself or that you've downloaded and imported. Um, I wanna show you how to make one and then how to export one. So I'm actually gonna move back into the filter library. I'm gonna move to the right side and let's just delete these different filters. And uh, we're, we're gonna create our own filter stack here. So uh, we've got this lovely picture of Ellie. And uh, I wanna stylize this image pretty substantially, maybe in a way that uh, is, is more over the top than normal. So um, let's start with bleach bypass. This is a really funky filter, and I'm not gonna talk to you about every single facet of each filter because we don't have enough time to do that. I, I would love to explain every single thing. If you do want to know more about an individual filter, uh, I'm gonna lead you in that direction because there's a website on the, or there's a page on the DxO help website um, that, that will tell you what every single one of these sliders does in every one of the pieces of, or every one of the filters. Anyways, bleach bypass, I've turned it down. I'm gonna click on add filter. We're gonna add film effects nostalgic. I'm gonna work quickly here. I'm just gonna change my film type to something like, yeah, let's change it to 10. So this is gonna be highly stylized. Um, and I know that there's gonna be some viewers here who um, vehemently disagree with my adjustments, but that's okay because I'm just showing you how to use the software and not, not necessarily suggestions and filter stacks. So film effects nostalgic, 
Um, and let's end this one with um, how about you know what? Let's let's just add cross balance here because that can be fun. And I'm going to change this to um, daylight to tungsten, and then we're just going to dial this down. So let's say we love this stack of filters, this bleach bypass, film effects nostalgics, cross processing. Let's see the before and after. There's the original. There's the after. Let's say we like this filter stack right now, and we want to save this so we can put it onto a whole series of images or use it in the future. To save a recipe, you make your filter stack, make your adjustments. You can have anywhere from one to whatever the maximum number of filters is. I actually don't remember how many filters you can add because I, you know, I'll add up to 10 sometimes and it works. So I'm not sure how many is the maximum to be honest with you. But if you have um, a, a number of those adjustments, you click the save recipe. It asks you to name the recipe. So I'm gonna call this like faded portrait and I'm just gonna give it the number one. Click OK, and as soon as I click the OK button, our filter stack recipe is going to be saved into our, um, actually the custom recipes section here. So it, as soon as you click that OK button, the software just navigates directly to the custom recipe section. And I've got 29, 29 of them in there, so I'm gonna have to go find it. It's uh, faded portrait. Should be in alphabetical order. Oh, it's not. It's down here at the bottom. Cool, okay, so we've got our faded portrait one and we're happy with it, right? Um, so let's figure out what we can do here in the interface. First of all, if you wanted to get rid of a recipe, you can just click on the little X that's in the upper left corner. The software is gonna give you a warning. In fact, let's do that here. Landscape filters basic. I'm gonna get rid of that one. I'm gonna delete it. So when I click the X, it says, are you sure you wanna do that? You say, yeah and it gets rid of it. Let's say you were, wanted to export this recipe. So, um, you know, I wanna share this with a friend or with another computer or something like that. If you click the upper right corner where there's this arrow pointing up and to the right, uh, you click that and it's gonna say, okay, where do you wanna save it? So I might actually go to the desktop, create a new fo folder, and I'm gonna call this um, CEP4 recipes. Wow, if I could type. There we go, CEP4 recipes, click create. And what's gonna happen is the software is gonna write a .np file, which is basically some metadata that informs um, the software what filters and at what percentages and what um, settings you're using. So that .np file is the information that ColorFX Pro is gonna use. It's a very small file, it's like 16 kilobytes or smaller. It's um, anyways, you click the save button and it saves into that place. So now I can go and, and export that, or I'm sorry, um, email that off or, um, you know, share it with another computer or something like that, whatever you're trying to do. Or you can back them up, which could be helpful as well. If there's, if you've got a set of recipes that you really like and you're using them all the time, it's not a bad idea to export them and then put them on a separate hard drive than the internal hard drive in case for some reason you have to erase your NIC software and reload it, right? So it's a nice thing to do is back up. It's similar with your images. It's not a bad idea to be backing up your photos. In fact, it's a really good idea to do that. Um, okay, so we've exported the recipe. Let's say we want to update our recipe. Like let's say this looks good, but turns out that I also wanna add the dark and light and center filter. Well, all you gotta do is move over to the right side add another filter or make adjustments to your filter stack that you already have uh, and then update it. So I'll show you that. So I'm adding a new filter in. You don't have to add a new filter, by the way. You could just change the filter stack that you already have um, and that's going to allow, you can update from there, I guess. All right, so I'm changing and customizing my dark and light and center. And now what I've got to do is go back into my custom recipes. So in the lower left corner, recipes, I'm already in custom. So I'm just gonna go ahead and scroll down to um, our faded portrait one. And because I've changed it, I can now click the click to update this recipe. So in the lower right corner of the recipe, there's this little thing here, a uh, little sort of roundabout. Click on that, it's gonna say, are you sure? You say yes and click okay. And now I have an updated recipe. Now, if I wanted to 
um, update the recipe that we exported, I have to save this again, right? So I actually have to export this new recipe because it's a brand new separate thing. So note that, right? Um, yeah, because now if I were to go to my desktop and email the old recipe, it's not gonna have the dark and light and center. So I just wanna point that out a little bit. Okay, so from here, I, let's say we just click the okay button. I've got plenty more images. We've already been looking at this picture for 20 minutes or so. We're just gonna click the okay button. We've got this highly stylized effect. This might be nice. I actually might do something like this. Like this is a photograph, um, you know, like where we, we might be recreating an image from the past with, a, you know, with Ellie here. So if there's a picture of, you know, her parents or one of her parents when they were a baby or young um, and we're recreating it with this, what we could do not only is recreate the posing and the scene like we've seen before, but also the post-processing slash match it to, you know, the historic or old print. Um, yeah, that would be fun actually. I'm. I like that idea, I might do that. <laughs> okay, so I'm on the wrong image. I'm actually gonna go to this image next because I wanna show you a couple things with control points and we need to talk about how to save a recipe with control points saved into it. I don't do it very often and it's basically you hold a particular button when you click the save recipe button and it will actually save the control points into it. Um, it might take a couple chances or a couple a couple tries anyways what we're going to do here i'm not going to apply that we're going to go to our filter library um let's go through this normally as i kind of would like to um, make some adjustments here save it as a recipe and then i'll show you how to save uh, control points into the recipe all right so um in this case i think we need the pro contrast filter um and there's some other adjustments that I wanna make. Now, really what I wanna do while I'm speaking or while, I'm, while we're doing this is talk to you about why I wanna do these things, um, not just tell you what I'm doing. But as soon as I start doing that, it takes me way longer uh, to explain it and, and then we run out of time in the long run. So um, I'm gonna increase perceptual saturation and some saturation here, but we're gonna apply this just to the sky with brilliance and warmth. Um, so we'll use control points. So I'm, I'm sure most folks here are probably pretty familiar with control points, but if you're not, there are two kinds of control points here within Color Effects Pro. A plus control point is going to have an opacity of 100%, which means we are going to get the filter effect on whatever we place the control point on when we place that point. So if I take this plus control point and I place it in the sky, two things will happen. The first thing that's gonna happen is that um, the control point makes a selection and puts the filter effect in, in that area wherever it's selecting. The second thing that happens, because we used a plus control point first, is that we're only putting the filter effect in the place that the control point is controlling, right? So if I hit the delete key, um, no control points on the image, this filter is being applied everywhere on the photo. When I click the plus control point, place it into our sky here, now it's like telling the software that we only want the filter to be um, applied in this area on that object. So anywhere I want the filter effect, I need to place more control points, right? And um, I wanna talk to you about the approach of control points. There's a, there's a lot of ways of thinking about these control points. Um, I've got four in the sky right now, and I think it's probably doing a pretty good job to select and put the effect in the sky but it's highly likely that I'm gonna have to use minus control points from the right side to remove the effect from areas where we don't want it. Um, I prefer to do this by eye, meaning I put the control points where I want them to be, I size them the size that I think they should be, they're gonna do a good job to make a photographic looking selection and therefore photographic looking adjustment. Um, and to get a good sense of what's happening, I usually will toggle the filter on and off but if you wanna know specifically where the filter is being applied, you click on the words control points underneath the brilliance or in, underneath the filter itself, basically. Um, and that opens up into an overall opacity slider, which is the opacity of the, um, the filter effect where control points are not adjusting, right? So if I bring this opacity up to 100, now the entire image has 100% of the effect. If I bring this down to 25, 
Now, the, the entire image has the 25% strength or opacity of brilliance and warmth, and the control points here are all plus control points, so they have an opacity of 100%. So now, all of these areas that these four control points are affecting has 100% of the opacity. This area, because this is a minus control point, has zero of the brilliance and warmth filter, and then everywhere else on the image has 25% which is kind of an interesting approach, right? Because usually when I'm talking about control points in these webinars, I only tell you about plus and minus control points. You can also have a partial effect on the image with adjusting the opacity, whether it's at zero or you know up at 10% or 20 or whatever. So it's a nice way to create a balance. All right, so in the control points list, there are a couple things to think about. You, you can turn a particular control point on and off by clicking on the little checkbox that's to the left. They are labeled, so if you click on one, you are activating it. You can see this is highlighted in gold, and this is the particular control point that we've activated or highlighted. Um, it is taking up 20% or is covering 20% of the image. It doesn't mean it's affecting 20% of the image. It just means that the area of influence the circle that's around the control point is uh, covering now 27%, or as I adjust it, 30 or 32% as we increase the size of the area of influence. Know that these control points are not making a circular selection, but rather they are making a selection inside of the circle that, that you've placed the point, right? So this is called the area of influence, and it is making a selection inside of that area based upon the thing that you place the point on. You're probably fully aware of that. Moving forward, um, if we click on this little box that's to the right of each of the control points, you can see the specific selection that each one of these control points is making. So as I go and check each one of these on, you can see uh, anything that's white has the filter effect applied to it based upon those control points. Anything that's black does not have any of the filtered effect. If I bring the opacity down, you'll see more of that. Um, and anything that's white has, uh, I'm sorry, anything that's gray has a certain amount of that effect. The lighter the gray, the more the filter is affecting that area. Um, yeah, so basically what we've got here are these really clean photographic looking selections. You can see it cuts these things out really beautifully. Um, and some of the adjustment is being applied in some of these areas. If I don't want them to be applied in those areas, we could just take minus control points and place them in these different sections. Um, I, I'm a fan of duplicating control points. The way that I typically do it, because there are a few ways to duplicate control points, the way that I typically do it is by holding the Option key down on my Mac or Alt if you're on a PC. And while you're holding Option, you click on the control point that you want to duplicate and drag it away. So it's option, click, and drag. And what I'm doing here is I'm just putting minus control points in all the areas where I know I don't want the filtered effect, right? And I'm kind of cleaning up or honing in our selections. Now, I've got, what, 20-something control points on the image? 18 control points in total on the photograph right now. I'm going to turn off the mask. So I'm going to actually just click on this box. So you can turn on or off a particular control point selection view by clicking the little checkbox, or you can turn them all on and off by literally clicking on um, the sort of mask box. It's the uh, rectangle with the circle in it. So I'll click that on and off, and the control points are still there and active and working. I'm just looking at the image now. So I've got 18 control points. It's done the selection adjustments that we want. Let's say now I wanna add another filter, and I wanna take these control points, and I want them to be applied on the next filter. What I've got to do um, is select all of the control points. Um, and actually, there are, I think there are three ways to do that. I think if I'm on the image, I can hit Command A. Yep, and that, that's going to go ahead and activate every control point. That's Control A on a PC. Uh, but basically, that activates all of those control points, and it's going to allow me to um, duplicate them because of that. But hang on. That's just one way to activate control points. Um, another way to activate control points, like let's say you don't want to activate every control point on the image, you just want like these four, you can just click outside of a control point and drag your mouse. So click and drag is going to give you this bounding box 
when I let go of the mouse click, uh, it's going to highlight those four, whatever ones I've encompassed. And that's another way of activating these control points so that we can manipulate them all at the same time or duplicate them. Um, and then the other way of doing it, because of course we're in the advanced realm now, um, is if you hold the command button down um, on a Mac, I think it's control on a PC, and as you're holding down that button on your keyboard command, um, you click on the individual control points that you want to activate, right? So there, there are those three different ways. Um, and you do these for different reasons. Uh, oftentimes, if I just want these four control points, you just click and drag, bam, done. Um, other times, like if I wanted um, control points that kind of intersect each other, it's smarter to just hold the command button and click on the individuals that you want. Um, and then other times, like the situation we're in now, command A turns on all of them because I want to duplicate all of them and bring them to the next image, or sorry, not the next image, the next um, filter. So I've selected them all by clicking Command A, and then to duplicate these or save them to put them on another filter, you go into the filter stack itself, into the specific filter that you're using, and then there's this little um, sort of menu button here. It kind of looks like a little hamburger or something. I don't know why they call it that, but it's three lines with a little triangle. If you click on that, this is where you're able to copy your control points so that when you add a new filter, you can paste the control points to the new filter. The other couple things that you can do here are reset the filters and keep the control points, or you can reset a filter and just delete the control points, right? So you've got those four options. I'm going to go ahead and um, click on copy. So um, when I click the copy button, that's going to copy all of my points. And um, I can now add a new filter and actually uh, paste those. So I'm going to click the add filter button here. It's going to paste the, I'm sorry, it's going to button up our brilliance and warmth. And um, we're going to click on a filter that's going to be highly transformative in this case. So I'm going to click on the midnight filter. And um, now I'm going to move up and just paste those uh, control points into this filter. So I'm going to click there, click on Paste Control Points. And now I've pasted the midnight control points uh, into that section, right? So uh, we have all of the minus control points around the image, and then the uh, plus control points applying the midnight filter just right in here. And what we could do is maybe go into the brightness and darken those tones down. Uh, we could adjust contrast and so on. And um, I'm not sure if this is an application that I would actually use the copy and paste control points, but it is a nice one where you can kind of see a dramatic difference, right, in the before and in the after. All right, let's say we do love this filter stack and we want to save it. And we want to save it with all of these control points. What we can do, of course, is click the Save Recipe button. but what I think we need to do, and I, I forget sometimes because I don't use this option very often, it's either the command button or the shift button. So let's see, we're gonna, I'm going to hold command, and I'm going to click on um, the save recipe button, and we're going to call this, um, I'm going to call it underscore test, and then one, just to see what happens. We're going to click the OK button. I'm going to ho keep holding that command button. Um, and as I do that, let's see if it actually saved it. Now, of course, I'm going to have to run through um, and find it. There it is. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, click on a different recipe, replace it, and now I'm going to click on our test recipe and replace that. And it does not have the control points. Okay, so I was wrong, right? Um, holding the command button isn't what we need to do. We're going to try option next. And I know it feels like we're hunting and pecking, but I'm going to show you a couple cool things so that we can get back to that previous state. So um, what, whereas I did mess up, I'll show you how to move back. So we're going to go into our history state browser here. Uh, this is the history state browser. It saves every single thing you do while you're in the software. And what I need to do is just move back to our previous filter state. right? And so we got all our control points back. So now, um, shoot, it's either option or shift. Let's, let's try option. Now I'm going to try shift. Let's try shift. Click save recipe. And then I'm going to call this underscore test two. Click OK. Holding that shift button down. Let's see what happens. Underscore two. All right. So 
here and then click here and voila. Okay, so it's shift. Let's let's verify that. I'm gonna click on click on carrot recipe. That goes and clicks okay. Cool, there are no control points. Now when I click on test two, we click yes. Now I I don't use this very often, obviously. I couldn't even remember the shortcut, but um, sometimes you might want to do that. You might want to save a recipe that has control points built into it, in which case to do that, you make sure you're holding the shift key down on your keyboard when you click the save recipe button on the right side. And that's how you're going to be able to um, get your or save your control points. Okay, so let's move on. We Oh, oh, I actually have another cool thing with filters, uh, with filter stacks. I'm going to click the cancel button here. We're going to move on to our next image. So let's open these up. Make sure that this is how we want it to be. Yeah, I know that's good. Okay. Click open. I Mind you, I've also, I've opened these up in Adobe Camera Raw, and I told the software, I told Photoshop to open them at 12 megapixels. Uh, and the reason I've done that, none of the cameras that we shot these with were, um, were 12 megapixel cameras. It's just I had the software do that uh, so that when we're processing these images while we're also in webinar mode, um, it's faster. Because the bigger the file, the longer these things are gonna take. All right, so uh, I wanna show you how to add multiple recipes on top of each other. Uh, so this is another cool feature and um, it's another one that I don't use very often. And now that I've um, saved that recipe with the control points. I'm going to, of course, forget this shortcut. I actually do use this more often than saving control points on a recipe. But um, let's, I'm going to move into the En Vogue recipes and I'm going to click on the lavender. Click OK and that gives us a recipe. That's the normal use or the standard use of clicking on recipes, right? We, we get what we've clicked on. Um, now, what I'm going to do is, I think it's the command button this time, one of the two. Um, if I hold, I'm going to say command this time, um, and I click on, soup, well, no, I'm not going to do that. Hang on. Let me back up for a second. If I just regularly click on super punch, what's going to happen is the filter stack is going to be replaced, right? Uh, I'm going to hold shift, click on super punch, cool, and that's the shortcut. Right, and so what we're doing here, I'm gonna hit Command Z on my keyboard. That's gonna bring us back one step, right? So now I've used the Lavender recipe. It's Film Effects Nostalgic and it's a detail extractor. If I hold the Shift button down and then click on a different recipe, it's going to hold our Film Effects Nostalgic in our detail extractor, but it's also going to add whatever this recipe is on top. And where that comes in handy in my mind is when I'm, if I've got a portrait, for example, and I'm doing some skin softening and then I'm doing like some contrast adjustments, and then I also want to add something like Blue Monday or some other sort of stylistic recipe, um, I, I don't have to worry about losing the work that we've done. I can just hold that shift button down, click on the new recipe, and it's going to add it to the stack. So now we've got three recipes that are added. Um, which so we're, we've got a lot of filters added onto this image, but it's a nice little shortcut. Um, the brush tool. All right, so we haven't talked about the brush tool yet. I think that's the last thing that we need to get into in the next few minutes. So uh, I'm going to move back one step. So previous to the Blue Monday recipe, let's just look at the side by side preview to see what's happening. I'm going to tap the tab button on my keyboard, and it's going to hide that stack. Right, so we've got on the left the original, and on the right the enhanced image. And let's say, let's say we want to um, brush the effect in somewhere. So rather than just clicking the OK button and applying the adjustments everywhere on the image, if we click the brush button in the lower right corner of the interface, what's going to happen is sort of the normal process. It's going to bring us back over into the Photoshop interface. Which, by the way, I'm going to mention because this is important. Um, the brush capability, this brush tool, is only an active tool within the Photoshop version of the software. This this doesn't exist within the Lightroom or um, uh, Photo Lab version of the software because what this brush tool does is it actually uses some of the Photoshop layer mask capabilities. 
so that it allows you to paint the effect in or erase it from areas that you don't want. And the way that I personally use this is to use control points inside of the NIC collection uh, as my sort of initial application and, and refining. And then I use the brush tool to just put it specifically where I want it to be while in Photoshop uh, because this is using layers and layer masks. And I'll show you that once we finish. But for now, let's just talk about our brush tool that shows up in the Nick Selective tool. Right, so the Nick Selective tool no longer is housing or, or is, we're not viewing the Nick collection, we are viewing the brush tool. We have four options. We can brush the effect in. Let's go ahead and just set this over here. And so I can use uh, the sort of normal tools in Photoshop to brush the effect in. I can soften the edge and so on. By the way, if you've never, if you don't use layers and layer masks, but you're a Photoshop user, um, th that's some homework for you for this weekend. Look up how layers and layer masks work, as well as brush, brushing. And you don't have to go in depth. There's a billion, million things that you can do with all of this stuff. You just want to get a good understanding of how layers and layer masks work, as well as um, a little bit of an understanding of how brushes work and how to size a brush and how to change the edge hardness of a brush. Those are really the only things you have to know for to, to get a lot of control, um, at least out of this kind of capability, because what we're doing right now is we're able to paint the filter in, and if my edge is really hard, you're gonna see that. You can see that's a really hard edge there. As opposed to if I soften the edge, which I'm just using a shortcut to do that, I can kind of have a nice soft edge around stuff. So when I paint it in, it's a little, I can conceal it a little bit more. Um, and then you can change the opacity of this too, but I'm going too far down that road. Uh, what I do want to do here is if I paint the effect in, that would be this button here, it's this little paintbrush. If I decide I wanted to erase the effect from some areas, you click on the eraser tool and my, tur my cursor turns into an eraser and I, I can go and erase those areas out. The other two tools allows us to fill the entire screen or um, sort of erase the effect off of the entire screen. So if I click fill, it's gonna fill our application in everywhere. And then what I might do is erase it out of specific areas where I know maybe I don't want it, right? So out of here or out of here and so on. Um, if I click the clear button in a little trash can, it just clears everything and then it kind of gives me the ability to paint the effect in where we want it to be. Um, and so, you know, in, in the long and short of it is this is a nice way to get to know how uh, layers and layer masks work pretty simply and quickly. Um, but again, I would advise that um, you learn how the layers and layer masks are working within Photoshop. You can still use this tool. It's just you'll have a better understanding of exactly how it's working um, and you can kind of create your own workflow around that. Uh, but this is the brush tool. When we're done with the brush tool, like let's say we like where we've erased the effect out. Just gonna fade that a little bit. Um, we click the apply button. So once you've, once you've decided that you're happy with the effects, you click the apply button. And then I don't have my layers open right now, um, but what we could do is we could clean that up had I applied it in a slightly different way. But basically right now we're sort of set in stone. So um, long story short, Lori, that's that's it. Um, that's my day. Yeah, yeah, hopefully that's good stuff. Good, good stuff. Okay, Dan, you ready for some questions, a few of them? Yes. Okay, yep, absolutely. cool. Minimal, yeah. Okay, so we had a couple that were more um, filter specific. So Jerry wanted to know, what is your opinion on using both tonal contrast and pro contrast on the same image? Huh. Yeah, that's. That's a great question. Uh, so the the broad answer is it depends upon the photograph, right? But the the shorter answer is that's a great combination of tools to use together. And so let's let's take a look. I'm going to go into the pro con. This image needs to be cropped differently, or we could put a film edge on it or image border on it. But um, pro contrast. The idea of pro contrast is is it's supposed to be helping to correct the image um, and usually what it's going to do is give you a little bit more depth in the contrast overall so if i use the correct contrast slider and then maybe i increase a little bit of the dynamic contrast if there's a color cast on the image we can correct that i don't think there is much of one here so um i'm going to 
turn that on and off and you can see the before and after here's pro contrast right and so the idea is it's correcting um maybe some of these areas that are a little bit more flat or where we we need to um bring out some depth by way of the contrast overall whereas if i click the add filter button and we add in the tonal contrast filter tonal contrast um is a is a sort of in my mind anyways a more creative aesthetic choice as opposed to pro contrast which is a corrective filter so tonal contrast is going to work nicely to kind of like uh, bring out little textures in the image uh, you can start to see the the veins in the um, in the flower with the application of the tonal contrast so this combination is really quite nice um you know when you do this you, you have to be careful of how much pro contrast and how much tonal contrast you're adding because it's easy to kind of take it uh, so far that it becomes really noticeable. Whereas, you know, it, with this application, because I've kind of turned down some of the settings a little bit, um, the the effect isn't necessarily subtle, but it's it's photographic looking. It doesn't it doesn't look so. Here's the before, and there's the after. It looks like we could have captured it this way, and there's just less flare in this image overall. But yeah, I, I like that combination. It's one of my favorite combinations of filters to use. Uh, pair that with um, dark and light and center. Maybe not on this image, but pair that with dark and light and center. Um, and you've got three of my favorite filters. Great. Okay, Larry wants to know, is classic soft focus, uh, what is the difference between diffusion filter and soft focus? That's in the classic soft focus. Got it. Um, yeah, you know, we can have this image open for that. So in, in the classical soft focus filter, this filter is attempting to emulate uh, glass filters, the soft focus filters or soft focus lenses. Uh, and, and there's a couple methods or ways of doing that. Um, you, can, you can have diffusion, like putting diffusion over the lens, or you could have a soft focus lens, which is a, is a, a different approach. And so the a different optical approach with lenses, right? So the idea of this method is to emulate those two different approaches between diffusion and soft focus. And I, I can't describe it any more than that, um, but we can sort of see the difference. In fact, here's another trick. Let's say we put soft focus on, um, let's diffuse the detail at 100%. Let's turn the strength up. Right, okay, so now we've got a, a really strong effect. Maybe it's too strong. And um, let's just see the before and after really quickly. There's the before, there's the after. And we're using method number one in soft focus. And then I'm gonna switch to um, method number one in diffusion. And then here's a cool trick. Uh, in the history state browser, uh, we can actually decide what we're comparing. That is, right now, um, I've changed it over to method number one, you can see, Right now, what we're looking at is in this lower left corner, method one. If I click on the history browser and drag this down to the filter state, and now we click on the compare button, what we're doing is we're comparing the last two settings. So we're actually comparing those methods that diffused in the soft focus. So here is the soft focus, there is the diffused, right? So you can see in the diffused, the shadows are um, a little softer. Whereas in the soft focus, uh, it's um, darker, right? You've got like a darker, more contrast to it overall. And um, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> but it's also a cool way to use the history state browser. All right, Sandy wants to know, when using a control point, the size of the circle looks quite large, covering more of the building than just the sky. How do you know how big to make the circle? And can you, um, again, explain, a few people are asking, is it just a circle? Uh, if you could kind of go over the control point selection, that'd be great. Yes. Um, so the control points, the, the area of influence, which it's the circle that's going around the points themselves, uh, those, those are a way for you to tell the software how far out from this object it should be reaching. And also what it does is it, um, it kind of changes the... Oh shoot, what's the term? The tolerance, right? The tolerance of the control point itself. And I'll, I'll show you, I think we were on this image when we were kind of describing the control point. So I'll go back to this photograph. So um, 
let's let's get into this. Let's I'm going to turn up perceptual color and our uh, film strength is already all the way up. And we're going to place a plus control point, let's say right down in here, right? And we'll try some in the sky as well. But let's look at what the control point is selecting. And then let's change the control point. Oops, sorry. Bring the opacity down. So right now we've got control point number one on, and you're seeing the selection. If I click on the control point and I drag it, you'll see instantly it changed the selection, right? And what the point's doing is it's looking for the tone, color, and texture that you've placed the point on that's basically inside of the circle, and then it has this nice fall off, as you can see. If I enlarge the control point, though, it's, it's affecting the tolerance so it's saying, okay, I should reach out to some other tones and colors because it's going to create a more natural or photographic looking selection, um, but it still does a good job around the edges of these things because the control point recognizes that the tone and color difference between this and this are dramatic. Therefore, it cleans up its selection. Um, the size of the area is, it is, it's kind of a subjective decision as to how you like using control points. And I flip-flop between these two things, either using one big control point, let's say in an area like the sky, or using several small control points that um, overlay on top of each other. It depends upon the image, but as I add these control points, now I actually have quite a lot of the effect outside of the area that I want. So in this case, maybe just using one control point would actually do a better job um, to select the area that we actually want to apply the filter. I'm not sure if I answered the question. I think I just went off on a tangent, Lori, but um, the, the idea here is that the area of influence, the circle, is going to affect the tolerance and the basically the size of the object that you're making the selection on. Uh, and I tend to try to encompass the entire object uh, when I'm placing the control point, or I will use many small control points to kind of like, um, uh, geez, I can't think of the term now, uh, create like a, a more precise um, sort of snake of control points in this case. Uh, and when I do this with this technique, um, I will make sure that the next and the previous control point are encompassed in the control point area of your influence. So you can see the control point to the left and the control point to the right are encompassed in the in the selection. Okay, here's a last question. Um, Cindy wanted to know if you could just quickly show how to go from color effects using the brush back into Photoshop. I should probably make some adjustment here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just apply it to the entire image. And so we're going to apply this filter and then I'm going to click the brush button instead of clicking OK. Bring us back over into Photoshop. I'm going to expand out my Photoshop. And uh, here's where we can, so now we're back in Photoshop and we can just paint the filter effect in where we want it to be. I'm going to soften the brush up a little bit and maybe just paint it into the border of the image. And then when we're done, we're just going to click the OK button or the apply button rather. I do, I want to be as careful as possible around some of these edges, in which case I should resize the brush, and even better than that, um, oops, use a Wacom tablet to um, be more precise with my brush. But okay, let's say we, we're done, we click the apply button, and we're back in Photoshop, um, you know, for normal usage of Photoshop. Well, everyone, if you had a chance, or maybe you didn't have a chance yet, but if you go to our website, and I put a link up there, you can go back and look at part one that Dan did, where it goes over some of the more basic things. This is a little bit more advanced or in-depth. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. Dan, I'll let you go ahead and close out this webinar. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got one minute right now. So I just want to tell you a few things of um, where you can find more great content. So you, you signed up and attended this webinar, you can see in the upcoming webinars. More will be posted very soon, I'm sure. Um, these are the previous recorded webinars. Lori sent you a link directly to this webinar, the basics are getting started, but we've got a ton of recorded webinars uh, for you to watch based upon different kinds of photography, based upon different kinds of uh, the different pieces of software from Nick Software. Um, to get to another great place to learn more about how the software is working, if you go to the nickcollection.dxo.com, so the main 
uh, page of, of Nick Software, go to the Explore section and click on Customer Support. And I think Lori actually sent you this direct link as well. But you can get uh, user guides and you can get individual software um, sort of advice and walkthroughs. So here's the Silver Effects Pro 2 tour. Um, you know, here's the Color Effects Pro 4 tour with the filters, applying a filter, and it goes into some nice detail. Um, like within the filter section about every single filter. And then, of course, on YouTube, uh, the Nick Collection uh, YouTube page has all of these um, long webinar, for, long form webinars, as well as short videos, too. Anyways, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out to the webinar. Uh, but thank you so much for joining. I love doing these webinars. It's a great way to end my Friday. Um, and I'm actually, I'm not ending. I've got two more things to do. But uh, it is a good time. So thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone.